Not quiet. It's family not quiet. Holy hours tomorrow, five thirty. Yeah. Are you in the St. Anne's mom group chat of people? You should be in it. Yeah, so our mom's group here, um, it's called St. Anne's mom group, whatever, and we have a group chat where we like, we try to keep it like not like the Chaldean mom's Facebook. It's a little different, okay? <laughs> that has its place in the world too, right? But it's more of uh, information of what things, because they're very active, right? They have like family holy hours, family stations of the cross, we have a fall festival, we have a trunk retreat, Christmas festival, um, I think that's it. BBS, all that kind of stuff. Anyways, being there for information. Every once in a while, like people are like, hey, I have a question. Like, hey, side text me. Leave this group chat alone. I'm in that chat. Women talk a lot more than men. God bless all the husbands in the world. <laughs> no, it's, it's uh, Telegram. Telegram? Telegram. What's that? Signal. Telegram? I have a lot of group chat stuff. Well, let me check, actually. Oh, yeah, it's because they're active at 521 because they talk a lot. Um, yeah, it's Telegram. Do you have Telegram? Inche, Dokun Telegram? All right, join the group. All right, I must say I'm very disappointed in the turnout. I printed a thousand sheets thinking we would use half of them. This is actually very disappointing. That's okay. We're, we, we, uh, we, are, we, uh, we didn't publicize this on purpose, so we'd have a bigger turnout. Didn't work out. Uh, we are going to record this and the diocese will post it. Good, so we'll share that as we go along. So um, as we begin, um, just you know, as we were talking as priests, we talk about these things all the time privately, then even in our clergy meetings, like we have to address the world, right? And that's, I think that's always the beauty of the church in general, is the church in her wisdom like, addresses the world as the world develops. Right? It's not like we're going to sell, like, the world is how the world is when Christ died and resurrected and nothing can change. The world changes, and then we as the church in her wisdom develop and, and, and kind of address the situation. Like, there's no way that St. Peter and Paul were writing about, like, transgenderism and gender dysphoria in the scriptures. It wasn't a thing, right? Now it's a thing. It wasn't a thing five years ago. Now it's a thing. Uh, and now it's an agenda. So as the church, you know, speaking with Bishop Francis, and Monica, who keeps disappearing. Um, okay, um, we're they're doing different initiatives, different desires. Like so, on the church front, how do we respond to this as 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 spiritual leaders? Monica, how do we respond to this as as educators and your rights in the legislation and all these things? And then Anita will discuss it. She is a teacher herself, as well as a mother of five, right? So she'll she'll also address it, kind of that. And then we'll have an opportunity for for question and answer. Make sense? Any questions yet? Not usually. Chaldeans aren't an inquisitive group. So without further ado, please welcome our shepherd, Bishop Francis. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Let's start with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, you came into this world in a family. You came into this world that through the family you may bless the world. We ask you, O oh Lord, to bless us, to strengthen us, to lead us, and to guide us. We ask you to send forth your Spirit, your Holy Spirit, that we may be enlightened, that we may have your wisdom, your knowledge, your understanding, also your strength, as well as your vision, to be able to do your will, and to be able to navigate as well as maneuver and overcome every obstacle that may come in our way. We ask this in your name. And we ask this for the intercession of the Holy Family, with St. Joseph as the Father and Mary as the Mother. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. First and foremost, I thank you for coming. This is for the Church to respond to what's going on in this world. And what's going on, it becomes important for us that we get engaged in this Battle. It's no longer a skirmish. This is a full-blown war. This is a this is a battle. And the church's role in raising children in the diocese, the family is the soul of the diocese. And at the heart of every family is a father who's doing his part, a mother who's doing her part, and the children at, at the same time. And everything that the father and mother do 
is always geared towards the children to try to make sure that they have done their part to give them the best of everything and the greatest of everything. And we as Chaldeans, we don't like to um, give anything less than what's great for our children. So we as a church, we want, we're, we've always taken a strong role about helping parents raise their children in the faith. Uh, this is now the challenge. It's no longer just in the faith. This isn't just catechism and communion. This isn't just giving them the knowledge of faith uh, of, of our you know, Savior Jesus Christ. The today, today the role is much more challenging. I'm gonna say this and it's gonna be taped and let it be. Our government is evil. Our government is fighting us. I'm not here for any political reason. I'm not here to say, vote for this one or don't vote for that one. I'm gonna make statements based on what we have and let the chips fall wherever they fall. Our current president has made laws against our children to destroy our children. Our current government leaders, local, state, as well as federal, they're at war with our children. That means they're at war with you. That means they're at war with us. Society practically overnight has changed. Five years ago, this was not an issue. It was beginning to become an issue, but it wasn't like this. And what's, what COVID revealed to us as well, our schools are no longer just safe places where we can send our children and be happy with the education. Unfortunately, our schools have become a danger for our children. The ongoing attack of the family, <clears throat> they're here to create chaos. First, they want to attack, they've been attacking fathers. That's been going on for years. If they can make the father to no longer be a man, become weak, become selfish, that means he's absent. That means he's no longer protecting the family. The mother, no longer loving, and that also has been going on for many years. She's out of touch with the families, what they want her to be. Um, she want, they want her to only love herself and selfishly seek after her own gain. She's therefore no longer protecting the family in love. Children, is the latest thing. And it came after destroying, or at least trying to destroy fatherhood and trying to destroy motherhood. Children no longer have an identity, and that's purposely done. They want them confused, no longer belonging to the family. They want them to give a different family. This is what you hear now. If you have a gender crisis and if your parents don't understand it, I will become your mother, I will become your father, I will become your parent. A lot of these laws that are coming in, especially ones that were signed by our president, are ones that say parents have no right to know, parents have no, no right to understand, parents have no longer any word. Who's the parent now? That's the problem. And that's what we're facing. So now society, government, wants to give a different identity for the family, and especially our children, to influence them and control them. It's very much like the mob. The mob, the mafia, the gangs, what they do is they provide family structure to a broken family. So when you have a broken family, you have a confused child, and this is where they can manipulate. So we're here to protect, to strengthen the family, protect children's innocence. We're here to prevent a mental health crisis, especially for our teenagers and our children. Uh, how did we get here? It began with the death of God. What I mean by that is you've taken God out of society, you've taken God out of mainstream life, you've quote unquote killed him, and proclaimed him dangerous. This is the problem that we're facing. This is a spiritual problem. 
It's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but that's one of the reasons that the church is engaged. What's the solution? Faith, hope, and love. Faith, strength that comes with it. Love, the sacrifice that comes with it. Hope, the clarity that comes with it. Solution is Jesus. And he is here with us, and he wants to fight for us. So what does this mean now practically? Let's look at first parents. Parents, sacrifice is what reveals love. The word sacrifice comes from two Latin words, to make holy. When you sacrifice your ch for your children, then you're blessing them. When you're sacrificing for each other, then you're blessing each other. I'm going to say something that's going to sound confusing in the beginning, but I'm going to have to explain. It's not about you seeking happiness. Because me seeking happiness today, it's this and tomorrow it's that. Whatever it is, today it's in the family, tomorrow it's outside of the family. And what I mean by that is, <clears throat> if I'm just going to go by my emotions, what makes me feel good, there are times when being in the family doesn't make me feel good. So what you're called to do is not seek happiness, it's seek love. That love will give you happiness. And sometimes it's not going to feel good. But that's what keeps families together. And that's what strengthens all of us. It's based on sacrifice, imitation of Christ. And again, that's, what you're, that's where you'll get your happiness. So, when you do that, then you're fighting society, you're fighting the government, you're fighting the schools. Because what schools are basically saying to you right now, especially when it comes to your children, they want to scare you. They want to scare you into following their agenda. If they can scare you, they can control you. And that's what they want to do. You're called to follow Christian values not scare tactics. And I'm going to say this, not your instincts, because they're going to get on those as well. Not what you think might be good at this moment. I feel sorry for my child, and that's why I want them to be happy, and therefore I want to give him this. But if these things are not rooted in something solid, which is our Christian base and values, you will ruin your children but not really mean to. That's what they want to do. Go back to Jesus. Go back um, to the basis. The natural law. Church law. God's law. And sometimes it means I say no. Sometimes it means I love you, but I won't support whatever this is, whatever that is. Don't question Jesus' love for you or his values for you or for your family. Now, putting that to the side, to the side, we need to fight. If you don't fight, you don't lose, period. Straight up. If you do fight, with God's blessing, you will win. Because it's ultimately not our fight. Our fight isn't with, our battle isn't with flesh and blood, as St. Paul would say, it's with the spiritual realm. It's the demonic, it's the evil, it's the devil himself. That's what our battle is all about, which means we need patience, we need grace. Ultimately, we need you to be grounded in Jesus. Because when you are grounded in Jesus, then you're not just battling, you're allowing Christ to battle with you. We're not going to let them win. The good news is they know it. They're seeing parents all over the world, especially here in the United States, that are rising up. We recognize that not only is it a spiritual battle, and I just want to step back a little bit, they've attacked our churches and our faith. As I said, they've already killed Jesus. They've already said that God is dead. They've already taken him out. They've already proclaimed Christianity as being dangerous. If you don't know this, there were some who came out and said, the rosary is a sign of insurrection. They've also come out and said that when there is a person who is going for a government position, elected or, or uh, identified, some have come out and said, I don't like the way you are holding on to your faith. 
because they were solid Christians or they were solid Catholics. So that attack against our faith, against our churches, so that ultimately they can sexualize our children. They're attacking the family, they're attacking our country. It's a psychological battle, it's a spiritual battle. Interestingly enough, if you fight, you're going to be the evil one. They're going to look down at you. They're going to label you. They're going to go and say that you're against science, you're against what's proper, and you're against your children. You're against your children's mental health. You're destroying society and you're destroying the family. It's a lot of pressure. We need to take up that pressure. That's why I don't blame parents who fall because of all this ugliness. But that's no excuse for us to fall. We need to rise up. We need to fight. We need to unite. We need to keep focus. We need to remain spiritually strong, mentally strong. We need to remain focused on the issue at hand. We also need to be peaceful. We also need to be godlike because we need to bring in grace. We need to pray. Pope Francis, just a couple days ago on World Youth Day, was saying, we need to look at Jesus, we need adoration. We need to let Jesus look at us. And he's looking at us and saying, I'm here. That's our focus. That's where the real battle exists. We know that this battle is long-term. There's no magic pill that you can take. There is no one person that we can elect and will abolish all of this. That's not going to happen. We need to get involved in our education system. We need to elect the right people in the different political positions. Yes, we do. But this is a long battle. We're not here just for today and tomorrow. We need to work together. Let's get a little bit deeper. Parents, do you know what your kids are doing? Do you know what they're studying? Do you know what they've learned or who they're hanging out with? I'm going to say this. Don't trust the schools. I don't care if it's a Catholic school. What I mean by that is, this doesn't mean that every school is bad. What I mean by it is, son, daughter, how was your day? What'd you do? What'd you study? Get that into a habit, if it's possible during dinner time, to get that conversation going. It doesn't mean that what you're doing is just propping. It actually builds better relationships between parents and children. It means that you ask, you seek, you seek, you search, you question, you need to know. And I'll tell you this, if you notice propaganda that your children are now facing, 15 minutes of explanation will deal with a full day of propaganda. That's because now you're becoming the educator with your children. You also need to live a meaningful life. Monkey see, monkey do. So if you're proclaiming one thing and you're doing another, um, being hypocrites in this world is not acceptable. And you're actually telling your children, yeah, 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 this thing about religion or about the right thing is just out there. It's, it's theoretical. It's not something you're supposed to do. Which means you need to live a meaningful life. Make the world better. It begins with God, the fear of God, the love of God. Now here's the point. Don't despair. Don't fool yourself. We're not winning. But we're not losing. There's a difference. We're fighting. They've had many years of preparation. We just woke up. We found ourselves all of a sudden in this position. But God is with us. If God is with us, who can be against us, St. Paul says. We will overcome. Just a matter of time. We need to win the education battle in America. Church is engaged in this battle. You're the heart of the church. There's no battle without you. Church does not have legs to stand on. When this issue, it is you. So we are now engaged with you, and you're our legs, and you're the firm standing ground when it comes to education, when it comes to our children. And this is where we are engaged with you, we're here for you, and we're here also 
to say that the battle is won already when Jesus died on the cross. We just need to make that battle now come into fulfillment. Amen. God bless you and we love you all. And thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you, Bishop. I want to welcome uh, Monica. She's with the Greater Schools Initiative, and uh, she'll introduce herself as well and uh, the role she plays in all of this because I don't exactly know. Okay, so please welcome Monica. <laughs> Okay, so um, did everybody get some handouts? Because I had a PowerPoint, but I didn't know we didn't have a projector in here, so I wanted to make sure we printed the two important pages out. Okay, good. All right, so uh, my name is Monica Yatuma. I know a lot of you in here know already who I am. Some of you don't, so I'll just um, share my story. So I was just like any of you, and then 2020 rolled around, and then COVID hit, mask mandates hit, and I about lost my mind. So I'm a very strong personality. I don't appreciate it when somebody tells me what to do, let alone tell me what to do with my children. So mask mandate comes along and uh, I wasn't happy about it. And I got together with some people like Anita and that's how we met. And um, we decided to go to um, our Oakland County commissioners. We were told that's who we needed to talk to because they were in charge of the budget. So we needed to go see them. I said, okay. So I got really loud on social media. I never with a lot of people. We ended up going to the Oakland County meeting. Um, I think we had about 1,500 people with us. And we spoke. A lot of people gave public comment. Anita was brave enough to give public comment. We ended up sitting next to each other, and that's how we met. And um, from there, that's kind of how everything started. My personal um, representative, my county commissioner, was not doing what we needed her to do. She wasn't standing up for the kids. She wasn't fighting against the Democrats. And I pulled her to the side and I said, if you don't grow a backbone and vote the way that we elected you to vote, I said, somebody's gonna run against you because we don't appreciate this. And so I ended up running against her. I threw my hat in the race. I ended up running for the Oakland County Commission. So that's how some of you might know my name. Unfortunately, I, I didn't win, but she has changed the way that she votes. So that was a win in my eyes. When I didn't win the seat, I wasn't really mad that I didn't win the seat. Um, I was just mad that I lost. I'm very competitive. I played sports growing up, but I knew I had to really lean on my faith because I was mad. So I leaned on my faith, talked to Bishop a little bit, and I, and I was just waiting to see wh why I lost. What's this other door that's opening up for me? And so somebody approached me. They had been watching me for a long time. And so they asked to sit down with me and, uh, you know, they said, I know you're burnt out. I know you ran this race. I said, yeah, I need a break. I need to get back to my family, my kids. And he's like, just chew on this. And he, he threw this idea at me. He said, there's this law about sex education in the state of Michigan. We're one of the few states that has it. I think we could start a nonprofit around this. I said, oh, man, am I going to have to put a lot of work into this? And he looked at me and he said, yeah. And I said, okay, you know what? I'm already all in. Let me think about it. Talk to my husband, prayed on it. I said, let's do this. And so we launched the Great Schools Initiative. This was officially in early November. So I'm going to tell you about the law that helped us get started. It's MCL.1507. What the law says is that sex education must be confined to a sex education classroom setting. So they can't teach it in math. They can't teach it in science. They can't incorporate it in any homework. It has to be in that sex ed classroom setting, OK, with a sex ed certified instructor. So they can't hang any flags or any memorabilia outside of that sex ed classroom and parents have the right to opt out. So if your schools are not already telling you that, so you know you have the right to opt out without any penalty to you or your child. They are not providing you with an opt out form. That's what this handout is here. If you go to greatschoolsinitiative.org, you can, we'll walk you through the opt out process. You can print out our opt out form. It's actually really thorough. I'll tell you why in a second. I realized I, I skipped a part, so I have to go back. So back to the mask mandate, um, I had got together with a group of people, Anita. Chris is actually here in the crowd. Chris was awesome. He was a huge help. 
and um, a few others who couldn't be here tonight. But we got together and we raised a bunch of money and we filed the first lawsuit in Oakland County against the mask mandate, right? But it wasn't the lawsuit that did what we needed it to do. A group out of here on Valley sprung up, came to me, hey, can you help us? Yes, help them raise money. They filed a lawsuit. I got together with a group in Walled Lake. The difference in Walled Lake is we were able to partner with the Thomas More Society. Someone had told them about me and they said, tell me what you're doing. And I said, I'm with this group. We want to file another lawsuit. We're trying to put a lot of pressure on the county. So they did some research, came back, and they said, all right, great, we can file a taxpayer-funded lawsuit. That was the lawsuit that got the mask mandate dropped because that actually had some legal standing. So that's where the relationship with the Thomas More Society started. And so from there, we fostered it. When we started the Great Schools Initiative, I went to them and I said, this is what I'm doing now. Would you guys support us? Lots of back and forth. And they said, you know what? Yeah, we'll, hand we'll handle your legal, your, your legal work so that you guys can go after these schools. Great, they pledged a million dollars. Without them, we wouldn't have been able to do what we're doing because, so I just explained the opt-out process to you guys. So when you use the opt-out process, if a school doesn't take your opt-out form, if they take your opt-out form, then they're violating what you've asked them not to do or what to not talk about with your students, you can sue them. So unfortunately, parents before never had the financial resources, never had the legal resources. That was one of the biggest reasons I started GSI, me and my co-founder, Nate, to give parents a leg to stand on, and that's where the Thomas More Society comes in. So currently, we actually are um, in suit with Rochester Hill School District, Troy Public School District, Wald Lake, and uh, Birmingham. We were also in court with Benzie, which is up north, but they came back and said, okay, we're gonna fix what we were doing wrong. So what they were doing wrong was one, they were talking about abortion with the students. Fortunately, Michigan is one of the eight states in the country where you cannot talk about abortion with students. You can't talk about it, you can't recommend it, you can't use it as a, for you can't say it's a, for it's a form of contraceptive, you just can't talk about it at all. So they were doing that. So fortunately, a parent came through and said um, that they were doing that, so we were able to talk, uh, take them to court on that. Sorry, I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Okay, so Benzie settled with us. So we're still in court with the other four districts. So if there's, if you turn in the opt-out form and there's any sort of form rejection or you turn in the opt-out form and they're giving you a hard time or they're still teaching certain things, come to GSI, that's greatschoolsinitiative.org. You file the submission for a violation and then we have our research team and our legal team get involved and then we can help you approach the school. There's a couple of different ways. I know a lot of parents don't like to just jump in and say, hey, I wanna sue the school. That's, that's fine, we understand. We have a template letter for you, it's done. You take the template letter, letter excuse me, and just kind of fill in the blanks, turn it into your school. It's basically a letter to let them know that you know what your rights are and you will not be taken advantage of. They still give you a hard time, then you can come to us and we can send a demand letter. That's basically saying to them, hey, we're going to court. So it's important that you guys know that you guys have these options because I know a lot of parents, they reach out to me all the time and they're like, I don't know what to do. They did this, they sent my kid home with this. And so you have options. That's the most important thing that I want you guys to take from here. Um, okay, Christian clubs, I can finally talk about this. So on a federal level, there is something called viewpoint neutrality. So I'm sure a lot of you in public schools saw they were putting up LGBT flags and all kinds of stuff everywhere. Okay, so viewpoint neutrality means, well, I'm not asking you to take the flag down, but if you're gonna put up an LGBT flag, well, I should be able to put up the Star of David or a crucifix or something Catholic related, whatever it is. There needs to be viewpoint neutrality. And they can't say no. So for those of you that don't know, there are GSA clubs in all the schools, Gay Straight Alliance, that's what GSA stands for. Okay, they have them everywhere. You're thinking to yourself, oh, my school doesn't. Yes, they do, you just don't know about it. Or they're using a different name so you don't know that they, that they have it. So um, we had to have our attorneys look into this and something I will talk to you in more detail about, Bishop, but we can start starting Christian clubs in the schools, but probably more particularly, I would say Chaldean Catholic clubs because I've learned that if we call it a Christian club, there are Christian churches that do believe in some of the things that we don't, so we'll talk more about that. But that's a thing we can do now in our schools too. All you need is a student willing to be a president, a student willing to be a vice president, and then a treasurer. We just need a teacher to sponsor, and then one of our priests can go in and they can have this after school club. So that's something we're gonna start pushing. Um, but just know that you guys have the right to do that in your schools. So what can you do as parents? Bishop talked about a lot of it. Talk to your kids, um, ask them a lot of questions, but most importantly, ask your schools about the curriculum, okay? The school board is there to work for you. They are taxpayer funded. 
You have a right to view not just the general education school curriculum, but also the sex ed curriculum because it's completely separate. So you have your school board, and then you have your sex education advisory board. So the sex education advisory board makes the recommendations for anything sex ed related. And then they give those recommendations to the school board. So if the parents have not reached out and said, oh no, I'm not okay with this curriculum, or what's this, or what's that, they're just gonna take that and hand it over, school board's gonna pass it. If you guys aren't calling, if you guys aren't emailing, if you're not going to your school board meetings, they're gonna pass it and it's done deal. It's set in stone for a good seven years. It's really important, today's parenting style has really changed. It's really important to go to your school board meetings. I go to school, my school board meetings all the time, but I attend them in different counties, different cities as well, to try to give a lot of parents support, because a lot of parents just don't know what to do or what to say. So it's really important to get involved, um, not just with the school board members, but all your elected officials. Again, they're taxpayer funded, they work for you. If you inundate them with calls and emails and ask them to set up meetings with you, they should be sitting down with you. They should never tell you no. Ask them questions, put pressure on them, let them know that you're watching them and that you're paying attention. Because if they think that you're not, believe me, they are not gonna vote in your favor because everything that's going on in Lansing right now goes against everything that we believe in. It's really bad right now. It's, Bishop touched on it, but it's, but it's nothing. What he said is nothing compared to what's really going on there. And they really are after our kids. And they really are after Catholicism and Christianity in general. Um, for those of you that follow me on social media, I do post a lot. What you don't see is all the hate messages I get, right? I've been told that I'm in denial and that Jesus is gay and that Jesus is trans. I mean, it's, it's wild, okay, what these people think. And they're not just saying it to be mean. Luckily, I have thick skin. It doesn't bother me. That, that doesn't bother me. The problem is, is, is the view of Catholicism, like we're evil. And so that's why it's important and that's why I post and I go out and I talk about it because we want to educate people on who we are and what we stand for and why Jesus Christ is important to us and why being conservative is important to us. We don't have anything against anybody that's LGBT, but it's really important to protect the innocence of our children because once it's gone, we will never get it back. And it's so important. You can see our 10-year-olds, our 11-year-olds, our 12-year-olds, they're very different than our 10 and 11 and 12-year-olds from five years ago, 10 years ago. They're extremely mature, sometimes a little, maybe even a little too mature. And we don't want that. We want to protect that innocence. Okay, we want them to understand that they don't need to be ashamed of being Catholic and standing up for what we believe in. So we printed out a, um, a book list for you guys, too. There's way more than this out there, but I wanted to ha have, in, I wanted you guys to have in your hands some of the names that you'll probably see the most. Some of them might seem a little innocent. You know, somebody said to me, you know, what's wrong with Lovely Bones? I read it when I was 12 years old. I'll tell you about Lovely Bones. It's very mature. It's very graphic. It's not terrible, but it does talk about rape. A rape does happen in the book. So when they're putting it in a 10-year-old's hands, my personal opinion is that it has no place in a 10-year-old's hands. If you're okay with your 12-year-old reading it, your 13-year-old, that's fine, but that should be a parent's right to choose that. So I want you guys to be aware of what these books are. There's a lot more. Um, if you follow me on social media, a lot of you already know, you can reach out to me anytime. I always make myself available. If you don't already follow me, it's just Monica Yatuma Official. You can follow me there. I post a lot about what I'm talking about too here. Um, the website for Great Schools Initiative is www.greatschoolsinitiative.org. Um, and I think that's it. So should I take any questions or? Okay, all right, thanks guys. Great job, great job, yeah. So, no more complaining about my fast preaching, okay? Because it happens out there, right? So, we, this is recorded, so that was a lot of information. We are gonna post it on the diocese social media and website. So it'll be very very accessible if you if you need to go back to that, or you refer back to that. Um, it's really good information. She has information there. She has an email list that's starting. A lot of good stuff. We, so, when we were doing these meetings, we had a lot of discussions about what do we do? So it was like, we really want the bishop to speak about the spiritual aspect of it, how are we gonna, as parents, to encourage you to like really take a stance on these things. We have to have a political uh, strategy to what we do for this. We can't just be like, yeah, it's no big deal, it is what it is. Like, no, we can do things. We have a voice out there, and we have to get, let our voice be heard. As well as, like, okay, now what do we do actually as like, like parents? Okay, we have all these things, then, but then you got boots on the ground, you have children, you have homes, how do we address that? So I asked Nita to come and to speak. Um, and she'll give us some guidance on like, well, not a, no one's perfect here, she's not a 
she's a great mom, right? But everyone has their issues. So um, how to, that's not a dig. It's not, it's don't, you're not a halo around you, right? So, but like, how to, don't be scared, basically. The goal of this, like, don't be fearful. Like, don't go out there as parents if you're so scared, all this anxiety, how do I raise kids? We'll be fine. God has already won the victory. We have to just allow the Holy Spirit and the peace of God to enter into your home. So let's just speak on, on that. As you speaking, I would encourage you to either think to yourself some questions, because I'll bring all three of them back up here for a little panel and a Q&A for all things directed at the bishop, for Monica, for how do we go to the school board, uh, and how do we address those issues, or Anita on some parenting advice as well. So I want to welcome Anita. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Anita Lucia. I've been married for almost 11 years to my husband, Raymond, and we have five children. Joshua nine, Francis eight, Maria six, and our four-year-old twin boys, Max and Blaze. I'm a high school English and history teacher by trade, but I'm going into my second year teaching theology at Brother Rice High School. So I have to type out what I'm saying because, um, and I apologize that I'm reading off of something, but I prayed through my thoughts and I wanted to make sure I captured whatever the Lord was asking me to say today. When I was asked to speak at this gathering tonight, my initial thought was, how can I contribute anything? We're only starting to deal with these difficult conversations in our home. I can't quite tell my kids the reason they're no longer allowed to watch a certain show or why I'm speaking in code about something to their father. I was on the phone with my friend who asked me why I'm using code words like L, G, and T when I knew all of this at their age, and I did. I didn't hesitate. I said it's because the narrative isn't on my side. And if I'm not careful with how I talk to my kids about this stuff, I could create more confusion than clarity. In my home, our parenting philosophy is called trial and error. In my classroom, my students teach me every day that I have a lot to learn. I reflected a lot about the heaviness of these topics that bring parents and an entire community of faith together. Fear, anxiety, a sensation of injustice, anger, perhaps paranoia, lingering thoughts about how these agendas could creep into our homes if they haven't already is enough to rob us from the joys of parenthood. However, what became even more overwhelming for me was the truth, and that is that we have hope. Our Lord and Savior wasn't only crucified, he resurrected. My, my God is bigger than any agenda or anxiety that can strangle away my hope. We are facing 2023 issues, but God has been defeating issues circa forever. He's not some rookie deity. God is, not God was. God is. Now, if you're anything like me, you find yourself saying, I wish I could go back in time when things were more simple and less complicated. But our presence here today is not accidental. It's purposeful. And God placed us exactly where he wants us to be because we are called for this very moment, and all of us are learning how to respond to these challenging times. Several years ago, when I was in college completing my business degree before God called me into a career in education, I took a final elective that was needed to graduate. It was a class called Marriage and Relationships. Our professor asked us to define love and read our answers out loud. I thought I nailed the assignment because I somehow had the right answer with a lot of fancy adjectives. However, it wasn't until the moment my firstborn Joshua was placed in my arms that I understand why love is a dying of yourself and a rebirth of something greater. If I could love this person so much, how much more does he love me to choose me to be his mother, to choose Raymond as his father? How much more does God love Joshua and all of us and all of, our, all of our children. We heard about our rights, now let's talk about our responsibilities. We're here because we are all fiercely protective over the children we work tirelessly to raise and have the right to be cautious about those trying to undo our work. But let's take a moment and work backwards here. The resources we have available to us today did not exist when we were growing up, but somehow our parents did something right because look and see where their children are today. 
gathered in the house of God because we knew the Spirit leads us to the truth. The church is one that is responsive to the times, which is why Bishop, in his wisdom, pulled us together tonight. So my mother raised my sister and I our entire lives as a single parent, working two jobs and doing her best not to fall apart. There were no support groups, websites, and even the privilege we have today of having so much access to our spiritual fathers. No one told my mother how to speak to us about sex or same-sex attraction, for that matter. She would teach us stories from the Old Testament, and I was fascinated by the story of Lot's wife turning into a pillar of salt. So I asked my mom why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's how that talk came about. I was probably seven or eight years old. I mentioned this to her from time to time, and she's still very proud of her, of her approach. Yeah, they were gay. I'm like, okay. Okay. Okay, that's how we had the talk. So how do you talk to your kids about same-sex attraction, gender identity? More importantly, how do we teach our kids not to hate? We are Catholic. We are taught to love, okay? So anything other than that is not Catholicism. It's your own ideology. Are we overthinking this too much? Was my mom's method of just telling it like it is right? Well, it was right for that moment because in the 80s, sexuality and gender identity wasn't discussed in a classroom around impressionable minors. These matters were private and left to the parents. This isn't the case today. We need to work with the moment. I discussed this topic with my nine-year-old recently. I wanted, her, I wanted him to learn from me before someone else got to him. So we went for a walk and I took a deep breath and simply said exactly what I said before I, I came up here because it could be very nerve-wracking to speak publicly in front of people. And I just said, come Holy Spirit. And I talked to him and led with how much God loves his creation. I explained that people have their own definitions of love, but we learn love from the one who created it, God. He said he had heard the word gay from one of his friends and the kid said they're idiots. Well, that's what Joshua learned. He associated a word with an adjective without even knowing what the word meant. But that's how hate begins. If my children grow up believing the Catholic Church doesn't love sinners, then they'll be the first ones to fall away from the faith because they would have lost all hope in the love of Jesus Christ, and that would be tragic. If we're not teaching our children to love and the source of that love, they will look for it in all the wrong places. Being pro-life means we teach our children that all life has dignity. However, it's also fair to say that I don't want denial of the truth to be dressed up as something called compassion. We must always err on the side of Jesus. The most powerful words in scripture to me are, thus says the Lord. He says it, therefore it is. It's easy to be impulsive about these conversations with our kids because we're feeling a sense of urgency, but I would suggest taking a pause Taking your fears into prayer and maybe writing down what it is you want to communicate to your child or children. Make sure your child knows that these conversations are private and not to repeat them with their friends, especially in a school setting where someone may take it upon themselves to correct what they've learned. Other parents may not be ready to discuss these topics with their children, so we need to be respectful to that as well. Also, it's important to note that the church supports families who have children that are struggling with their identities. This is nothing new. The church has always been there for everyone. I don't know what challenges I'm going to face tomorrow. I don't know what struggles or gifts my children will have, but I know God calls us to lift each other in faith and love, not condemnation or isolation. It's okay to ask other parents who are raising their children in the faith about their approach. We can all learn do's and don'ts from one another. I've been in a prayer group now that meets um, every month. We've never missed a month of meeting. 11 years, 11 years. We discuss these things often. We learn from each other, we disagree with one another, but our anchor is our Catholic faith. Um, if you visit the AOD website and just simply type in marriage and family, you will find some sort of framework there about the resources and support for families. Um, you'll find Catholic approved therapists, and we also have Chaldean therapists at Council with Science and Faith because those two things most definitely work together in the Catholic faith. Um, and speaking of programs, before I lean into it, I, I have to say there's one discussion that turns into a debate quite often, 
It's that of Catholic versus public schools. Um, if you're, you know, in your parent groups, there's no way this has not come up. This is always one of those debate topics, okay? My kids go to Catholic schools. I work at a Catholic school, but I went to public schools my whole life. Um, I, and I still remember the teachers that inspired my passion for language arts and history. Some of my co closest friends who inspire my faith went to public schools and send their children to public schools. Okay, but I will always advocate for a Catholic education, and that's the one that starts in your home. We need to stay vigilant because if we're not living the faith, our children aren't living the faith. No matter which institu institution they're a part of, it won't matter. We are the first responders to our children's spiritual health, not the school. But we also have another option, and that's homeschooling. So this fall, our diocese will be launching a homeschool co-op at both Holy Martyrs and St. Thomas. The hope is that these pilot programs will lead the diocese's ultimate goal, ultimate mission of creating a homeschool program by the fall of 2024. Um, again, our church has seen a demand from our community to support families to begin educating their children in the home. Um, the program has the full support of our bishop, and you can find more information on chaldeanchurch.org slash homeschool. So please don't be intimidated also at the prospect of homeschooling and begin doubting yourself. Okay, no one's expecting you to be some kind of a scholar, and that's the only requirement that you can have to homeschool your children. That's not true. There are, our church is here for you, and you will be around parents who have the same questions that are probably running through your heads right now. So be comfortable seeking information and going into it, and, and there's a, a bunch of resources there for you. Our church is here to support you if you make that ultimate decision to homeschool your kids. Um, now, I don't have teenagers at home. I'm a high school teacher. I did my internship in Detroit at an all-boys public high school, another one at Warren Mott, and now teach at Brother Rice. As an educator, I'm also a forever student because I can't predict the challenges of tomorrow. But it's impossible to ignore the commonalities between these students. And what I'm about to tell you is um, it, it's nothing new. It's nothing you don't already know. Teenagers are addicted to social media. Okay, I'm going to say it again. They are addicted to social media. When certain topics would come up in my classroom, and for example, one sticks out in my memory, uh, we were talking about miracles. A student asked me if the church recognized some guy somewhere who was doing all these miracles. When I pressed on about the story, it turned out to be something that was trending on TikTok. Now, being dismissive and turning on the student or your child will not suddenly transform their thinking and make them more aware of what they're seeing on their screen. They'll be turned off by you. We already know that social media is an endless abyss of information. You don't need me to tell you that. But what shook me at the moment is the fact that these students believe they're being evangelized by something they're watching through their screen. That's scary. Um, these images, stories, ideas, etc., they become tattooed in their heads and in our heads. Uh, I completely disconnected from social media when I was pregnant with my second child, someone posted an image of a child who had suffered at the hands of ISIS. I will never get that image out of my head, ever. But I was old enough to have the prudence to disconnect. Our children don't. They're absorbing what they see. Our daughters are emulating women who appeal to the eyes but offer nothing to their minds. And the woman with the most likes in history the most successful influencer with the largest following is the Virgin Mary. She's been trending now for over 2,000 years, and the only part of her body she had to reveal is sitting in the tabernacle behind me. Let her be the influencer your sons and daughters admire. When I was discussing this with my friend last night, she said, Anita, can you add something? Tell parents to go through their kids' phones. We have these discussions with parents who have teenagers. Um, until the day I moved out of my mom's house, the day I got married, I didn't know that something existed called privacy, okay? If you find something alarming, don't be impulsive. Pray, wait, and seek guidance with your approach. But you have a right to go through your children's stuff. My mom went through everything, everything. Journals, love notes, you name it, mom went through it. 
You have a right to do that. Go through your children's stuff. And if you're really good, you won't get caught, but you'll kind of find a way to bring it up to them. Um, my mom wasn't so discreet. She'd be like, what is this, okay? So now I'm 40 years old, and I remember um, one Bible study that started on the east side when I was in my 20s by Father Andrew Yunan. Did I say that right, Father Andrew Yunan? Um, I know Mother of God had a program too, but today there are youth and young adult groups almost every single day at a parish in our diocese. How amazing is that? Please encourage your children to get involved. I spoke to a relative of mine who said his mother drove him almost 30 minutes to CLC here at St. Thomas. He was struggling with his own teenage challenges and in a dark place and said CLC became a home and community for him. He's a college graduate today and still keeps in touch with the people he met through the program and serves in his parish. For myself, I went on the Kairos retreat in 2008 and I described the experience as me leaving the retreat with the retreat never leaving me. It changed my life. I actually became pro-life because of a single moment on that retreat. I also met my husband on Kairos two years later when he was a retreatant and I was a leader. And that's allowed, okay? No bylaws against that. Results not guaranteed also, okay? Please remember your own faith journey. Remember a time when you fell away and how many times you doubted. Our children have their own stories that are still being written. Don't lose hope because you think outside forces are closing in. God is the force, period. But we still have to do our part. We need to live out our faith, and part of what makes what I'm saying uncomfortable is having anyone in here thinking I'm not saying this to myself first. Don't worry, my mom uh, loves to critique my parenting and gives me Google-like ratings when she leaves my house and tells me how I can improve even though she forgets I was dodging flying objects she'd throw at me growing up. And I grew up thinking she had a syndrome that made talking without yelling impossible, but she tells me I'm too loud. <laughs> but my mother made sure of one thing. She made sure my sister Jamie and I never missed Sunday Mass. She'd pick up, my, she'd pick up her mother, my grandmother, and my great aunt. So that's two kids and two old ladies and my mom. They complained about their hips or medication or whatever it was or something else, and I'm sure Jamie and I were acting up as well. I can't imagine it was fun for my mom. I hated going to church. It was boring and unfair that I wasn't allowed to sit in the children's room or have snacks like the other kids. But as I grew up and into my faith, I can tell you, if my mother never said the words, I love you to me, it wouldn't matter. That was love in action. It was a foundation she was laying down for us. She brought us home every Sunday, tired, overwhelmed with life and doing the job of two parents. God equipped her with strength and he will do that for us as well. When our kids grow up, they will never describe the love we had for them by any worldly things we provided, ever. They forget how angry they were when you forced them out of bed to go to mass, but they will remember sitting next to you Sunday after Sunday in a pew. And that's something I will always remember is sitting with my mom in a pew on Sundays, no matter how tired I was or how sleepy I was or how tired she was. When I spoke to a counselor at my school about the struggles parents were having with their sons, she told me she would ask if they prayed with their children. Parents found it awkward to suddenly do so if they never had or said they did at one time when their teenagers were kids. Here's a newsflash, they're still kids, they need us. Let the Holy Spirit guide those moments as uncomfortable and awkward as they may be. Pray with your kids. So why am I hopeful? Well, for the same reason, we should all be hopeful. The Chaldean church is bursting at the seams and you only need to go to church on a regular Sunday mass to see that. And we are growing. We have 13 seminarians and all glory to God. This is a blessing. That means 13 men, God willing, will become priests. And I guarantee their parents have the same concerns we all have. But the Church of Martyrs still stands today. No persecutors in history and even our own sins will ever destroy the church. We're capable of destroying ourselves, but the church will always be here because no agenda or ideology will take God down. 
Don't put God on the same playing field as the devil. Let's live our faith boldly and without fear and be an example for our kids to do the same. Thank you. God bless you. Good. Again, reminder that all the information will be on the website so that we can get more information. I think this is actually a whole night worth rewatching for a lot of information. Any questions? I'm going to call the three of you up here, if you don't mind. I'm going to go to him now. I'm going to come to you, okay? Aren't they amazing? That's all I got to <laughs> say. What are you doing next Sunday? I need a homily. Both of you. Just a quick... I forgot uh, to make, forgot to make yeah. one announcement. And Merle was, gonna, he was texting me and he was mad at me. Stand up, Merle. This is Merle Yusuf, guys. So he works for us at GSI. He does a fantastic job. So everything I was talking about, we started actually holding um, leadership trainings for parents to walk you guys through everything, give you a more detailed approach of everything that I talked about. So next one is this Saturday, 10 to 2, here, in the basement here, if anybody is interested. So we do them all the time. Anything else, Perone, so you don't yell at me again? Okay, all right, thank you. Good, yeah. Yeah, also just for <laughs> Just a reminder that Wednesday also we're having a, a similar thing, uh, very similar actually, at St. George because we have a huge community. So two sides, kind of how it is, so we can respect all communities. I want to just represent uh, Patrice and Angela. Yes, stand up. They are going to be the kind of the directors of the homeschool co-op here at St. Thomas, both of you. So if you have any questions on that, on any of that, if you're concerned about it, um, talk to them. They, as you can see, are wonderfully average human beings who are not scholars, who are not like PhDs in education, so, but they're going to do great. And homeschooling is all about that. I've talked to very few families who found themselves overwhelmed at homeschooling. They all like it very much, and they have normal kids, I promise. All right, good. So thank you so much. So see them afterwards. They'll be here with the table information. Good? Q&A? Ready? So first of all, thank you so much for all this information. Obviously, like, like you said, some parents know about it, some parents don't know about it, and we appreciate everything that you've brought today and you've informed us about. Um, we appreciate Bishop as well for being here and taking the time. So my question is, besides all of the information that you provided, this is all outside resources, right? That is outside of our parish, that is outside of our church. It supports what the church is about, right? It supports our Faith it supports everything that we speak for, but we also need more from the church. And I say this, Bishop, because I grew up back home. I didn't grow up here. And the way I grew up was we had the nuns were always involved, the bishops were always involved, the priests were always involved in the community. The amount of support that we received, not only from each other as families, but from the church as well, to make these children understand what we went through, I don't believe that we have that as much right now. And with all due respect, you guys are doing an amazing job. Obviously, we wouldn't have 13 seminarians, right? And so on before them that have became priests and nuns and so on. But if you look at what was done before and the way that the world was before, and I understand it changes, right? And that's why we need more. We need more. And I say that with with all due respect to everybody, with all due respect to you and to, to our priests, I know you guys are doing as much as you can, but we need more. Our children are not growing in the same way we have, and it takes a village to raise one child. So can you imagine if you have five, like she does, or four, or six, or seven? We're trying to grow our faith just like the other faiths, right? We're trying, we're pro-life, right? So we want more children because we want our faith to grow, because we want to alert the, the life that we have and the people that we are around of our faith, correct? But in order for us to do that in this age is hard, correct? We give love, we give sacrifice as much as we can, but we need help. So my question to our church and my question to you, Bishop, is how can the church help us more? We, I understand that we have catechisms for kids, and that starts at a specific age. I understand that we have support groups. I understand that we have um, 
summer camps, right? All that costs money. And although I might be able to afford it, some other families might not be able to afford it and might not be forthcoming about the fact that they cannot afford it because they're working one, two, and possibly even three jobs, whether it's a mom alone, whether it's a mom and dad, but they still can't afford, they can barely afford to put food on the table, let alone to try to send their kids to Catholic school or let alone to be able to homeschool their kids and teach them at home. So what, is, what can the church or our community through the church offer more to support those type of people that can't afford to send their kids to Catholic schools, can't afford to put their, fam you know, their kids in summer camps. What can the church provide? I think it's a great question. Before we get even to the answer, the situation in Iraq 10 years ago, 20 years ago, is not the situation in America today. Um, there was a big trust in schools. Schools played a very large role in helping raise our children back in Iraq. And if you ever came back home saying, my teacher punished me, what are your parents gonna say? How dare they? Oh no, what did you do wrong? What happened? And one time I did that and I actually got punished by my dad. The unfortunate thing that's happened is that the influence has entered into our schools way back. I'll give you an example. In high school, sophomore year in high school, I never went to Catholic school. I know what you're talking about. I went to public school, all until I entered seminary. In my sophomore year class, uh, in my English class, the teacher showed a video called, and I don't remember the exact title, but it's something about the genius of English. The English language is spread all over the world. Pilots all over the world need to know English, whatever, whatever, whatever. There's so many different, di different dialects and accents of English, including, as they were going through it, gay. What? Sophomore in high school. This is 1986. That tells you how old I was. Or how old I am. Point is, is that they started to infiltrate little things here and there. I have a younger sister who got her master's degree in uh, education in San Diego. She one day showed me an activity. Here's the activity. The activity was on a Saturday or Sunday, whatever particular faith you belong to, go and experience another one, a different one. So for example, if you're Catholic, go to a Muslim whatever, prayer service on Friday, go to a synagogue on Saturday, go to a Buddhist place, whatever. There was a list of places that they had listed. You wanna hear a shocker? Gay bar. My sister showed me this. One of the options is to go to a gay bar as an a, as a experience of another religion. That was early 90s. They've infiltrated. They've started throwing it out there. The church has always been involved. The situation in Iraq has always been different. Who was our enemy in Iraq? The biggest enemy that we had is if they were going to force religion on us. That was our biggest enemy. It wasn't if your child is being taught to do A, B, C, and D that goes against their faith. Now, here, what are we doing about it? It's taking the church a while to respond because we're not getting all of the information. We're not in public schools. This is where working with parents and the government today is not like the government of Iraq. The government of Iraq will hear the Catholic Church, with the exception of today with the whole problem with the patriarch and what they've done to our church today. It, it, that's a completely different argument and God bless our patriarch and God help our church in Iraq because they have now just kicked our church to the side and said you no longer have any influence. That's what they've done. Anyways, put that to the side. How much influence do we have here in the United States? Um, I'm sorry, your Catholic church, this is a public school. 
separation of church and state. So problem number one is we don't have too many rights. Now, we've got government initiatives that says that we can come in, we can teach, and this is what we've been trying to do by language, by faith, by extra curriculum outside of the school. We have limited amount of success and then something happens and then it sets us back. We've tried in different Catholic schools and we've actually tried in different public schools as well. We haven't been able to find something that sticks. If you uh, remember about maybe 20, 25 years ago, there was a group that was called the Care Group. They actually were in three or four different public schools. One of the things that they were doing is working, especially with Chaldean kids, uh, mentoring, working with them, helping them, and also allowing them to recognize that as Chaldeans, as Catholics, we don't do certain things. That lasted for about four or five years. That didn't also stick as well for too long. This is because once the school says we no longer want you, or once we lose interest by those who've been doing this, we don't have new people coming in, we have problems. The church is all in. The church wants to do everything for our children, but also the church is only taking your kids for two hours a week. That's a big difference. This is where the church now finds itself in a similar but different role. The, the, the role of today is to support you as a parent. We're not going to become parents to your kids. But when you come in to us and you say, these are the different issues, and I've asked, believe it or not, I've also asked that I want a group of moms and dads, parents, who can let me know regularly what's going on in the different schools, because we need to know. We need to understand. I want a group of parents who will influence whatever things that we do, because I don't know what's going on in schools. I'm not a parent. We're all in. I don't want to come up with a cop-out answer. We want to do more, but the more that we understand, the more that we're seeing it's a tsunami. This is huge. This didn't exist three years ago. I said five years ago, three years ago. We are not going to be sitting back. There's already, we've already lost a lot of kids. We didn't even know it. But this is where we're putting, we've been discussing this in clergy meetings. We've been also pushing for this. Now, I have to speak on behalf of my priests. My priests are being pulled in 30 different places at the same time. To expect our priests to do everything is the current situation that we have here today. We're about 20 priests to 200,000 Chaldeans. Maybe closer to 80, 180,000. It's just easier math. So take 20,000, I'm sorry, 200,000 Chaldeans, divide that by 20 priests. Who's good at math? One priest for 10,000 Chaldeans. That's not fair. Now, this is not an excuse for us to step back. No, no, we're engaged and we need to jump in. And we need to, if you look at the whole history of the church in Iraq, it changed, the, the role of the priest changed based on how society changed and everything is changing. We need to adapt to where we're at. This is now the United States. This is now actually Michigan. It's different than California. It's different than Chicago. Chicago's are part of our diocese. We need to get engaged in Chicago, and that's a similar but different fight because there's different laws. So we need to assimilate. The bottom line is, we're all in. But there's a lot more that we don't know than what we do know. And so based on whatever we're getting information, if I wish we could start up today 20 different schools and take out all of our Chaldean kids from public schools and put them all in Chaldean schools, it's not realistic. We don't have that. We don't have that ability. God willing, we'll have a school maybe in five years. And it's a big maybe. And even when we do just exactly what you said, that means, wait a minute, 
how many can we put in this school? I know what it means to struggle. As I said, I, was, I came from a family of five children. All of us went to public schools. And all of us had to deal with whatever we needed to deal, but it had to be done on a family level. The church needs to support the families and the initiatives in the families. That right now is the best we can do. If there's more, we'll step it up. And we do more, right? There's just to respond to, to her kind of criticism, really, is that there's, a, there's plenty of things in the church, a lot, the majority, the vast majority of things we do in the church are for families and they're free. Right, and what even I can't speak to other parishes, but what we do here at St. Thomas is, you know, every every evening is something going on, right? So uh, Tuesday is junior high girls, Wednesday is high schoolers, Thursdays is um, junior high boys. There's catechism on Saturdays, and if it's ever a financial issue, we'd be happy to accommodate anybody. Money should never get in the place with Jesus. That's not just people showing up. That's the leaders involved, and the priests involved with the leaders involved with the night. So it's all over the place as far as children and, their, and the, the leaders are growing in their faith. So this is a community, a body of people who serve each other. Right. So to, to kind of reiterate what the bishop says, one in 10,000 is a lot. And then the new laity for the Vatican II, all these beautiful things, the laity are at the stronghold of the church. We are spiritual leaders, we're happy to be it. But like I would challenge to your question, like what are we doing to build a better community? And the kind of what I want is like the, the community at large and the Secular world is secular, but this can be a sub like community, a community of believers who love each other, who support each other, who love God, who are relatively normal. So come to study. There's college kids studying here all the time, all that kind of stuff. All right. I can't do what they're doing. You I'm shouldn't do what God they're doing. They're doing what I can't do, and that's what we can do. And that's all of us coming together. And everybody has a role. And everybody has a position. Questions. Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Anita. I have um, a son that is five years old. He is um, speech delayed. So he is attending Wald Lake. So Monica, you had mentioned that there's a lawsuit. I was informed of Troy and Rochester. Can you explain the one at Wald Lake? Because I'm not aware of that one. Are you asking to explain the lawsuit? Yes, yeah, so I can't talk details of the lawsuit, but I can just say that several parents attempted to turn an opt-out form and they denied the parents' request. And so we sent a demand letter, and so they were kind of playing games and saying, oh, we have to talk to legal, oh, we have to give them a, 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 an opt-out form that has our stamp on it. So lots of back and forth, and finally we said, okay, we're going to court. So. If you want to ask me to the side, yeah, we'll talk. Ask her after, yeah. In the back, and then we'll get to you. Yeah. I'm going over there. I have to walk over there. This is why I asked everybody to sit up front earlier. Everybody ignored me. <laughs> Hold on, I'm almost there. Hi. Um... I really appreciated the response that Bishop Francis had earlier. I had a question. If we wanted to get involved and donate some of our time to help organize parent issues um, at St. Thomas, how do we go, who do we contact to do that? You said ask a question. <laughs> organize what? To help, to help support what you were talking about with building a community within the church. Like how do we get involved? Is that a question for me, Anita? <laughs> There's a rumor going around that we have an awesome moms group here. Um, yeah, We have a moms group um, at the church and we have a lot of stuff going on. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about, when, I'm sorry I didn't get your name when you asked your question about, yeah, about the church and being involved in stuff. Um, one thing I said is that your kids have to feel like the church is their home in any capacity. If you're here volunteering your time, um, I brought my kids here on a Monday to clean, and they, they just, I mean, just the fact that they were allowed to go up here and do something, you know, it, it's, it's so important that they see that their mom is doing something, okay? Um, I want them to have these memories in a church and know that this is their home. 
So there's a lot that you can do. You, you can volunteer with the church. It doesn't have to be this parish. Um, there's, you know, there's something going on with, with our mom's group. We have like marriage ministry. We do like a couple's night. We have our, our fall festival coming up and it may seem like, well, this is just a family thing and we're just gonna attend it, but you can volunteer there too. Your kids could see you giving back your gifts to the church. And that's one thing, one way that um, you can be involved in your parish. There's always room for, for someone. Um, there's plenty of opportunity to do, to do something. We have, we have a you know, pretty big diocese, so there's opportunities in, in almost every single church. Yes. Yeah. So I'll just I'll just answer that by answering a lot of the questions that have been asked. And uh, is man, I'd hate to be like JFK up here. Like, what are you doing to better your community? Right. Like, that's the challenge. Like, I, well, what I found so fruitful. And he doesn't had a prayer group for eleven years, and that, that I found that so un unbelievably fruitful is you create a you create families, you create community. Find eight people who love Jesus, whom you can meet with monthly, and you can talk about God, the scriptures, you have a specific topic for that night, and then you have their friends, and they're friends with each other, and then they can grow up and date each other and marry each other, and like that's how you build a community. And then you come to church on Sunday. And the church is a community of communities that's already been built. We're a community of families, and family is a community. So it's, it's not as if, like, well, we have this program that we meet on Tuesdays from 6 to 8.30. You can come and bring your families. You can sign up a register. Those things matter, right? But they're also kind of more organized. You don't need to be as organized with creating community. Build it. Build it by building it. And create, I would encourage everyone to build it amongst themselves. Good. More questions? I'm going to wrap up. It's late. And it's beautiful outside. Why is he now? She's up front. I'm coming. You're going to use steps in. Yeah. I'm at like 4,000. Okay, my name is Saba. Um, I have twin daughters. Uh, they serve every Sunday at the church. Uh, they are going to seventh grade. They attend Sherabank, uh, well, uh, Sherabank's Middle School. Well, actually, I have two questions. First, a question Is there is a way that we can access the school library? Uh, online because so far I don't have any issue but I don't want surprises normally sometimes they just start with the book in the school and the English class so either I you know sometimes the summary out of the book you know in the back is not enough doesn't give a lot of information if I have time I'll read with them the book if not at least I do um, a quick Google and read the review what the people say so there is a way that we can access online the library school. Uh, yeah, in general. I'll just answer. I can answer this. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. so that's a very good question. I don't think every school has their library books online. If they do, I think it's great. Um, some of the books, I. I have seen the pictures in some of these books. If I was to call them pornography, it's not enough. It's drawn pictures of sexual acts that are very explicit for high school, middle school, elementary. I'll give you homework. Go to your schools, your kids' schools, look for these books. When you do, open them up. What you see, your kids will see. You've got a list, they're right there. Some of them are not as bad as Monica was saying. Some of them, adults should not be reading or watching or seeing. They are horrifically sinful and disgusting. Your homework, when school starts, go to the libraries. When you see this, one way that you can do is GSI can help out with this. They don't have the rights to put these things in there. Another thing is, when you have a community of parents who stand up and actually fight a school or a school district, they will get our attention. The church, if you want the church to write a letter to that school, we will. 
If you want us to say, why is this here, we will. If you want us to come out and to say that this is unacceptable, we will. When they see the church, we've already been labeled as terrorists. When they see parents, and they're saying the same thing on a different level, it's going to be completely different. We have had priests go to these, some of these, uh, what do you call it, monthly uh, board of education, whatever, uh, gathering. Didn't do much. Parents do a lot more. But, what do you need from us? You need a letter? We'll write a letter. You want a lawsuit? BSI. We're doing a wonderful job with all of this. Um, for, for the last past year, more than a year now, uh, that I've been involved with them, I've seen a lot of battles won. And more battles will be won. Because the law is on our side, believe it or not, here in Michigan. But do you want to speak more about the libraries and things? Yeah. Um, Quickly. In regards, okay, the library. Your children have a designated library day, right? I think most of you guys know that. They go to the library once, um, once a week. You can find out from what section they're allowed to pull books from. I did that. I wanted to find out where my kids were allowed to pull books from. You can simply ask that. I mean, just to, to bring this down, just to simplify this. What section are they allowed to pull books from? Are the books pre, um, are, they, are they taken out beforehand? Are these things that, you know, because they, they need the kids in and out of there too. So they take out a bunch of books, they have the kids pick from some of these books, they're not just walking around aisle after aisle, okay? So you can just ask, when's their library day? And what section are they allowed to pull books from? And what books are being pulled for them? Okay, I'm going to wrap up, guys. I'm sorry. Um, um, just a final note, if I may, as your pastor, and care for your souls. Um, like, be not afraid. Right? Parents are at a level of anxiety that I've, that I'm, like, it blows my mind. Guys, everything's fine. Control your home. You have the ability to create a holy home, a prayerful home, a peaceful home. In this home, we love each other. In this home, we talk about issues. And even talks about like her mom telling her about Sodom and Gomorrah. I remember my father talking to me about sex when I was like 13 or 14 or younger. Like that happens. Have these conversations. Your kids are not dumb. They have access to pornography by the time they're eight years old. Like have conversations with them. Bring them to church. Build the community with them. Talk to them about their lives. They have no privacy. Be intentional parents. Trust that your children aren't your children. They're God's children. You're just responsible for them for a few years and trust God and be at peace. You know, don't let the anxieties of the world overwhelm you because that's the devil's tactic. Don't overwhelm yourself. Okay, we're good? Bishop, can you give us your blessing? Please stand. Also, real quick, I'm sure they'll all be here afterwards if you wanted to ask them some questions, especially Monica and her team and Patrice and, and Angela time, for homeschool stuff. Okay. So if you want to talk to them afterwards, they'll be around. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you to lead you, to guide you, for you to experience his love, and for you to become instruments of his love. The Almighty God bless you all, the Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. amen. God bless you all, and thank you for coming, and we will work on this together.